The late 1960s was a bit of a rough period for the NATO carrier fleet, at least if you weren't American. After the Second World War, a number of nations had taken the opportunity to avail themselves of the large number of surplus vessels, basically British, that had become available. But 20 years on, these ships were old, outdated, costly to operate, and about to get even more so. Because 20 years of aircraft and anti-aircraft development meant that if these aircraft carriers wanted to stay viable, they needed major updates to their air wings, with the old 1950s jets they operated now hopelessly obsolete. The Dutch and Canadians swiftly got rid of their carriers, and even the British, who actually had comparatively large and newer ships in the shape of HMS Eagle and Ark Royal, had to bite the financial bullet and accept that they could only afford to operate a single flat top. To be fair, as the US Navy had recently commissioned the giant Kitty Hawk class and the USS Enterprise, the world's first nuclear aircraft carrier, plus had the even bigger Nimitz class under development, it probably made sense for the European nations to pass this responsibility over to the United States. Or at least it must have seemed at the time. <coughs> Falklands War. But for the French, this wasn't an option. They had pulled out of NATO military cooperation in 1966, and so couldn't rely on American carriers to protect their extensive interests overseas. Though to be honest, the French didn't actually expect the US to be a reliable security guarantor on this issue. A lesson they took from the Suez Crisis of 1956, and one of the reasons for their partial withdrawal from NATO. But they also had two modern carriers, the Clemenceau and the Foch, which had only commissioned in 1961 and 1963 respectively. What they did have an issue with was their aircraft. For their fighter, they chose the Vault F-8 Crusader, a good choice, as it would provide decades of useful service as the French fleet's interceptor. But for their carrier attack aircraft, they went with the Dazzle Etard IV. This had begun development in 1956, when its transonic performance and 3,000 pound bomb load would have seemed fair enough. But it shows the pace of aircraft development at the time, because when the Etendard entered service in 1961 with the French Navy, it was obviously outclassed by just about every other contemporary carrier attack aircraft. By the mid-1960s, the French decided that a new aircraft would be needed for them to really get the most out of their new aircraft carriers. On the face of it, the obvious option was to buy American, either the McDonnell Douglas A4 Skyhawk, or the new LTV A7 Corsair II that was being developed for the US Navy at the time. But with their naval fighter, the Crusader, already an American design, purchasing their attack aircraft from the same country would leave them exposed to coercion by withholding of spares and technical advice, should the Americans ever decide they needed to apply pressure to the French over some issue. Bear in mind, the US had taken the split from NATO and the subsequent kicking of their military personnel out of France rather badly. Plus, never underestimate the influence of national pride on French military procurement. So, the French thought it best to develop their own naval attack aircraft. And they had just the thing in mind, a navalised version of the French Air Force's newest aircraft, the Sepicat Jaguar M. The Jaguar had been developed as a joint project between the British and the French. Beginning development in 1966, the aircraft had originally been intended to be jointly produced by both countries, but for different needs. The British wanted a supersonic trainer, while the French desired a light attack aircraft. As it was, the Jaguar ended up becoming a far more capable aeroplane than had initially been intended, and would provide both nations' air forces with one of their principal ground attack aircraft for the next three decades. But the Jaguar's evolution and program success, quite frankly amazing considering the issues encountered along the way, tends to overlook the fact that the French really wanted it to also be a carrier aircraft. Indeed, their initial orders for the Jaguar were for 75 two-seat trainers, another 75 attack aircraft for the Air Force, and 40 Jaguar M's to replace the Etendard IV, with the expectation that 100 Jaguar M's would be purchased in the long run. To this end, the fifth Jaguar prototype was built as a test aircraft for carrier operation, and this first flew in November 1969. 
The aircraft was essentially the same as the standard French attack variant, though with the addition of an altered and strengthened landing gear and an arrestor hook. Initial testing of the aircraft actually took place at the British Royal Aircraft Establishment in Bedford, as the UK was the only European nation at the time to have land-based catapult facilities for testing carrier aircraft. These trials started in April 1970 and focused on making sure that the Jaguar could stand up to the pressures of catapult takeoffs and arrested deck landings. By July, it was decided to see how the Jaguar managed on the real thing, and the aircraft rendezvoused with the Clemenceau off the French coast to conduct deck trials. All of these initial tests and flights were conducted with the aircraft in a clean configuration, with no external load and weight carefully controlled. The successful completion of this program led to the Jaguar M returning to Bedford in 1971, where trials were now conducted with heavier and external loadings. It then returned once again to the Clemenceau for more tests, to see how both the aircraft and the carrier stood up to use with operational weights. By now the Jaguar M had conducted over 200 flights and things looked reasonable. But this last round of carrier tests did create some concerns. Throttle response left something to be desired, and it was thought that should the Jaguar lose one of its two engines, then it did not have enough power to safely land aboard. It was also discovered by the French Navy that they would need to make modifications to their two carriers for them to operate fully loaded Jaguars safely. Obviously an unwelcome extra expense, but if you want to operate frontline aircraft, then these are the things you have to do. And in terms of the engine issue, well, the Jaguar's twin Adore turbofan engines were a new development, and the issues with it were being worked out, with it ultimately becoming an excellent power plant. To be frank, nothing very exceptional in development of a new aircraft. But the issues were enough for the naysayers to start casting doubts on the Jaguar M. And in 1971, when this was all occurring, that included the company now responsible for building the aircraft. That year, Breguet, the French company that formed half of the SEPICAT joint venture with Britain's BAC, was bought out by Dazol, and Dazol, understandably, wanted their own aircraft to be purchased, the Super Etendard, and they started lobbying hard for its adoption. Amongst their statements was that the Jaguar M was going to be more expensive to build than anticipated, on top of the issues that the testing had shown up needing to be resolved, whereas the Super Etendard, as they pointed out, was based on the existing aircraft in service, but incorporating modern technologies that were already being developed and integrated into new Dazzle aircraft, like the F-1 fighter. Therefore, it should be cheaper and a simpler option, which would allow the French Navy to purchase the full 100 aircraft that they required. Whereas Dazzle now said with the new costings on the Jaguar M, the French Navy could only afford 60 of those. It must be a practically unique situation for an aircraft to be in the position that the company making you don't actually want you to be adopted, but that was a position that the Jaguar M found itself in. The French Navy continued testing with it until 1973, at which point they made the call and cancelled its development, instead choosing to go with the Super Etendard. Somewhat ironically, this was a single-engine aircraft, and while the critique of the Jaguar was that if it lost an engine, it could be tricky to land back on the carrier, no one seems to have pointed out what would happen to the Super Etendard if its engine failed i.e. it would definitely crash. But to be fair, it did go on to serve the French Navy until 2016, and gained a reputation as a ship killer with the Iraqi and Argentine air forces when combined with the Exocet missile. Though it did end up costing more than expected, and the French Navy, again somewhat ironically, had to settle for purchasing just 71 of them. But as for the Jaguar M, well, though it didn't get to sea service, Happily, it was not scrapped, and in fact is on display at the French Naval Aviation Museum at Rochefort.